Hi, welcome to the last episode of the season, episode 10. For some years now, there has been a lot of talk about how important it is to have a well-established game model in a team. In general terms, we're talking about a set of ideas and concepts that will structure the team's behaviors in a match. Nowadays, most coaches acknowledge the importance of having a framework with principles and sub-principles that will guide their team in the pitch. And we have already shown in previous episodes how it helps bring clarity to different moments in training. Now, to help coaches organize their thoughts and create a special game plan, stay with us as we share ideas on how to address the foundations of a team's style. To begin with, everyone has a preferred style of play, whether it's more possession-oriented or counter-attack. However, context will once again play a big part in developing a game model. Knowing the players you'll be working with and their level. Assessing the competitiveness of the championship you'll be playing with. Understanding the club's culture, among other aspects, must be taken into consideration when you're trying to create a game proposition that will extract the most value possible from the players and the team. Unlike planning exercises for training sessions, I believe that there is great potential in taking ideas from what the big teams out there are doing. That happens because the positionings that are working at elite level will have a bigger transferability to a more regular context. For example, the way you press or the way you play out the back can be replicated and tweaked in a way that works for most teams. It is no coincidence that we have witnessed the trend of playing a 4-3-3 and then moved on for a 4-4-2 and more recently we have the trend of playing a 3-4-3 and a 3-5-2. To a certain point the game model can be a source of competitive advantage, at least until it's replicated or countered, hence its importance in today's football. In addition, there's nothing wrong with mixing different ideas from different teams, as long as the final result is a game model that is seamless and that you can comprehend and explain to your players in a clear way. Moving on to building the game model, one way that you can organize your idea of the game is by splitting the game into five moments. Offensive organization, defensive transition, defensive organization, offensive transition and set pieces. Here's a summary of what you should think about in each moment of the game. For the sake of simplicity, we will not go into much detail about the sub-principles of the different moments. Starting with offensive organization, it represents the moment in which your team has the ball and both teams are organized. In this moment of the game, your team is attacking with a lot of players and your opponent is defending with a lot of players as well, so we have a clash between two large structures. That being said, what behaviors are you looking for in these circumstances? Do you want your goalkeeper to play short or long? How many players do you want to see involved in the build-up? How do you want your players to be positioned to attack? What collective behaviors do you want to see? Or how do you integrate the game principles in this stage? Now, when your team is attacking but loses the ball, it shifts to the defensive transition, the second moment of the five. This represents a short period of time in which the team is adapting to the new context of not having the ball and is not yet fully organized behind the ball. So, what are you looking for here? A quick reaction or that your team retreats to defend deeper? Press individually or try to cancel the line of pass? In a way, answering these questions will allow your team to have a plan that nullifies or delays the opponent's attack. As your team is able to reorganize defensively, establishing a large defensive structure and slowing down the attack, it enters the moment of defensive organization, which is exactly the opposite of the offensive organization. Here, do you want your team to start pressing high, three quarters of, of the pitch or low? What will be the pressing triggers? Where do you want to direct your opponent to? Do you prefer to man mark, zonal marking or have a mixed approach? These behaviors aim to stop the attack and enter the fourth moment, offensive transition, characterized by attacking with less players at a higher pace in a moment when the opponent is not organized. To do so, what do you want your players to do when they win the ball? A side pass or look for frontal support? Perhaps play direct to the back of the defense? Are you looking to explore the flanks or the middle? Additionally, the fifth moment, set pieces, will be covered by your strategies to take free kicks, corners, throw-ins, penalties and goal kicks. 
In the end, it's very important that coaches create smooth transitions between moments. For example, when they're attacking, their positioning should take into account the risk of losing the ball and vice versa. Having organized the game into different moments, one way that coaches can find the answers to all of the questions above and many others that will come up is to base their game model in the game principles and the creation of numerical advantages. Now, notice that I didn't mention dynamics like the winger cuts inside and the fullback does the overlap when the team is attacking on that side. That is because I believe there is great value in letting the players decide and adjust to the different contexts of the game. Let me show you what I mean on the pitch. For example, if we want to decide how to start the play with the ball from the goalkeeper, the game principles can guide our decisions. In this case, the goalkeeper needs passing options to his right and to his left. From the five-a-side dynamics, we also know that we should have two options in front, one short and one long. That can be provided by our midfielders. Now that we have guaranteed passing options and depth, who can be responsible for width? Exactly, the fullbacks. From this structure, and depending how the opponent is pressing, the coach can decide to add one more player, take one out, ask the fullback to make an inside movement. Options are endless and are guided by thinking about the game principles. Now picture the situation where the team is attacking. If the opponent presses with one striker, we know that to achieve an advantage we only need two players. And for each player he will need an option on both sides and in front. From there you start putting the pieces together and adjust according to what you think makes more sense to your team. Alternatively, if the opponent starts pressing with two, it will require a third player to create an advantage. Who? Any one of the three midfielders or a fullback, as long as the team is balanced and able, and able to maintain shape. This way, the team adapts collectively to that situation without the coach needing to impose who goes where, promoting more unpredictability. Altogether, if you develop a general idea of how you want your team to behave in the different moments of the game, and back it up with the game principles and the search for numerical advantages, chances are that the players will develop an independence that will allow them to adjust to the different positions of the ball in any moment of the game. On a different note, one of the struggles that I used to have was that I had absolutely no idea of what kind of players I was going to coach and how they could fit in a game model. From my experience though, I came to learn that in the initial stages of a project, it's impossible for a coach to pass along all the information about how he wants his team to play. So for that reason, there is time for the coach to analyze and eventually change, tweak or create some of the ideas that he wants to see happening on the different moments of the game. For example, in my last experience, we only decided the system that we were going to play in one week into the project because we had absolutely no clue of the kind of players and the characteristics of the players that we were going to have. For that reason, we started by doing exercises very focused on the game principles in order to guide some behaviors that we wanted to see happening and we started building from there. What's more, it may be the case that the coaches need to make some changes to their game model during the season, and that's okay, because building a game model is a never-ending process of adjustments in order to find the solution that promotes the best performance possible. Personally, I've even made changes to the game model based on intelligent movements that my players made that were not contemplated in the original game model, and there's nothing wrong with that. To wrap everything up, one fundamental aspect of bringing a game model to life is having the ability to create the most adequate exercises that will put the ideas of the coach into practice. Moving on to this episode's Q&A, I got a question asking if having a game model means that the behaviors of the team will be the same in every match. Well. I would say that most of the behaviors will be the same in every match. However, one way that coaches can shake things up is by teaching the players through the game principles to act according to certain movements and certain actions that occur in the game. For example, uh, if the ball is in a certain area, then the player will know that he has the freedom to make a movement to help the player with the ball. That doesn't mean that the player will always make a forward run or that he will always make a supporting run. It just allows him the freedom 
to understand what is best for that situation. In contexts where the coaches have the ability to analyze the opponent beforehand, it is possible that there are some changes in the positions and movements of the team uh, in a way that can better cancel the opponent. However, that uh, already is talking about strategy, which in itself is a whole other episode. <laughs> this wraps up our first season of episodes. However, we will continue to post content on YouTube and across all the social media channels linked in the description. In addition, we will continue with our WhatsApp group active in case you like to discuss other training topics. I hope this experience was as enriching for you as it was for me and once again, thank you for watching.